My guest today is Dia Liu. Dia is an engineer and lawyer turned real estate investor who now invests in boutique hotels and short-term rentals full-time. Her transition path from practicing attorney to quitting her law firm job to invest full-time spanned all of one year, during which time she scaled from zero to nine short-term rentals, earning $100,000 net rental income annually. She currently owns three hotels and a dozen STRs in Texas, New Mexico, Arkansas, and North Carolina. She runs the Facebook group Airbnb Professional Hosts, and she now travels continuously on prospecting trips for new potential STR and hotel investments, and recently started an STR and hotel investment fund called Welcome Capital. I invited Dia onto the podcast today to discuss and share tips and insights on short-term rentals and hotel investing, including how to analyze, prep and design, and automate operations for short-term rental properties, as well as to hear her thoughts on her transition from law and engineering to full-time real estate investing and what has made her uh, successful as a real estate investor. So I think it's going to be an interesting, insightful discussion, and I hope you learn something from it. Let's jump in. Um, I'd love to maybe start just by, you know, uh, you know, learning a little bit about your background, at least for our listeners. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about your background and an origin story you know, what you were doing before becoming a full-time real estate investor, how you got into short-term rental investing, and then, you know, also later transitioned to hotel investing. Yeah, so um, I graduated with a double major in biochemistry and chemical engineering from UT Austin. I went to law school with a full-ride scholarship in New York City, Um, and then I practiced patent litigation law for about five years. Um, and then basically I just, uh, one day I realized that I really didn't want to do the nine to nine work schedule anymore. I really wanted to travel the world and experience things beyond just, uh, the cubicle life. Um, and so even though I love my colleagues at the time in New York city, I decided to move back to Austin and start real estate investing on the side first. And so I found a job in Austin as a patent litigation attorney here, um, and, basically was moonlighting or not moonlighting really, but just taking holiday time and, um, and uh, weekends to set up short-term rentals and start buying them like crazy. And so I was able to reach from $0 of rental income and really zero real estate experience to over six figures of net rental income about 13 ish months. Awesome. So, you know, now sort of fast forwarding, you've transitioned to hotel investing. What was that like? Where was that inflection point and uh, what prompted or motivated the change? Sorry, can you say that again? What prompted your uh, transition into hotel investing? Oh, so it's a long story, but um, to basically... um, So we started hotel investing because of a lot of different reasons. So the main thing that prompted me to look at short-term rentals um, first was because I love traveling and I love design and I love hosting people. So I, um, I feel like with hotels, there's a lot of similarities in those aspects because I still love design. I still love um, traveling and it's still a lot of the same concept, just much bigger projects. And the reason why I decided to do hotels is because one, the short-term rental space was getting a little more saturated. There were a lot of folks after larger podcasts like Bigger Pockets started talking more about short-term rentals. I feel like a lot of people started jumping in this this space and bidding these house prices up um, to where sometimes the numbers don't always make sense anymore. Or if you are trying to be truly conservative, the returns are not as good as the you know how much maybe additional risk there might be. Um, and then the other reason is because I was um, long-term flipping some of these short-term rentals, meaning that I would buy and hold them, and a year later, they would double in price. Um, and so I was able to sell them for a really, really great profit. Uh, but And usually, they appraised for exactly how much I wanted to sell them for and how much 
the buyer wanted to pay. But sometimes uh, we ran into situations where the buyer wanted to pay 500K, I was willing to sell it for 500K, but the appraiser might disagree with our, you know, with our contract and price. And so the reason is because the neighbor next door might not rent their house out. It doesn't matter what the neighbor next door is making, but um, if the neighbor's next door's house only is worth 400K, then my house is only worth 400K. Um, and it doesn't matter if I'm generating six figures of income on my property or not. So, um, and so that really, is not so ideal, I guess, for, for the lack of a better term. Um, and so I wanted to get into commercial assets where the valuation of the property is based on the performance of the property. So if you're making more money, then the property should be worth more, which makes a lot more sense to me than with residential real estate. Uh, and then finally, the reason is because you're able to scale a lot more quickly um, and buying four, 40 unit hotels is a lot easier than buying 40 short term rentals in one year. So you're able to deal with one set of mortgage, one closing, cl closing date, um, one set of broker, one set of difficult seller potentially. And it's just a lot easier to scale, uh, faster. And, um, and then additionally, um, this is a bonus, which I didn't think about at the time, but uh, when I went into this, but now looking back, this is an additional bonus is that um, short term rental regulations are becoming more and more common. So um, having hotels are basically immune to short term rental regulations was a huge perk. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So to sort of set the stage so folks understand, can you talk maybe first about what is the breakdown of your current real estate portfolio in terms of like residential short-term rentals that are say four units or less versus non-hotel multifamily, you know, five plus units versus full on hotels, just so to kind of set the stage. So we have, um, so I co-own three boutique hotels with business partners. I also own a small multifamily STR. Um, so if you count the multifamily short-term rental plus additional single family duplex short-term rentals, and I'm around two, um, around a dozen additional short-term rentals on top of the boutique hotels. Got it. Are those like physical structures or doors? Uh, door. So 12 additional doors on top of the hotels. So with the hotels included, I think I'm at 90 something perhaps doors. Yeah. Okay. And like. How many of your portfolio properties are ones where you are like the sole equity investor versus there being, you know, other equity investors co-invested with you? Well, whether as GPs or LPs. Um, I think about um most of my short-term rentals out of that dozen, I own a large chunk of it, uh, or I'm the sole investor. Um, and I do own a large majority of their hotels as well. I'm the I'm the KP on on all these deals. Gotcha. All right. So I'd love to talk a little bit about like sort of the analysis process. Could you walk us through your, you know, step-by-step -step process for quickly doing a kind of first pass analysis to screen a potential STR deal in a new market, say that you haven't invested in before. And, and for these purposes, let's say it's just, you know, residential four units or less kind of like the, 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 the simple version. Um, I think there there's a lot of simplification if you just walk through a, a five second uh, analysis. But um, with that said, the one of the first things I do is to get to know the market and what kind of amenities that the guests, potential guests, target guests, uh, would be interested in that market. So are they interested in five bedroom houses or are they own, interested in one bedroom condos? And are they more interested in being as close to the ski list or the beach or whatever amenity that is as possible? Or do they want more space, more privacy, spreading out, having more amenities like fire pits and gas grills and stuff like that. So understanding what it is that drives tourism in that destination and uh, what micro neighborhoods are going to work well for that, uh, that destination. And finally, what amenities are going to work well for that destination is key. And that is not really like a simple uh, one sec, uh, one minute analysis. Um, and, but looking at the numbers, 
we're looking at at least um, somewhere between 20 to 25 percent cash on cash return. Usually, I average. I normally a lot of my deals are a little bit higher than that, um, just because I see a lot of enough deals to where I have to be a little bit pickier about what I'm buying. And so normally we're higher than that. But for a lot of my mastermind folks, we're, uh, we're advising them to look for about 25% cash on cash return. And that's like assuming you, you know, you're take it's levered, it's 15, 20% down. Is that right? Yeah. So with short term rentals for your first few, you might be able to get what's called secondary home financing for your short term rentals. And that's completely okay with your lenders that you are renting this out on Airbnb and VRBO. Um, for most of the lenders with regards to secondary home financing. So if you're able to qualify for that, and there's a lot of different factors and they're constantly changing. So I don't want to give you the wrong um, updated info whenever someone's listening to this podcast. But um, if you're able to qualify, then you're able to put 10% down on your short first short term rental or second short term rental. Got it. And you mentioned, you know, like, like trying to find out what are the amenities that folks want in the area and kind of what is the setup they want? Do they want to be close or secluded, et cetera? How do you know that? Do you go on Airbnb and just like look at what other comparable listings are, you know, offering, et cetera? Like, how do you develop that kind of insight? Um, I, there's a lot of data analytic tools out there. So AirDNA is one of them. There's data Rabu. There's a lot of different tools now and SCR insights. There's a lot. Um, so it's really to look at all these sites and go on Airbnb and VRBO as well. On top of that, to um, uh, basically check out your competition to see how many people are super hosts, how many people have really good reviews, uh, what are those reviews really saying, um, which kind of properties are doing best. Is it those with pools? Is it those with hot tubs? Uh, is it those with beach views, uh, oceanfront views, mountain views, etc.? So yeah, so you do have to look at your competitors a lot in your due diligence. Yep, makes sense. Um, and you know, um, it, you you see a lot of deals, but you know, probably most of them are are not suitable for you. And um, you only you'll only go deeper on maybe a handful. So again, in that kind of first pass where you're just filtering out the the wheat from the chaff, um, sounds like you do an, an amenities analysis. You'll look at um, you'll do a quick like financial analysis. Like, are there any other other things you, that you will do on a first pass analysis? Regulation and zoning. So if it that part that HOA or that town or that city or that county doesn't allow for short-term rentals and that's a big no-no or if there's potential looming short-term rental regulation or looming short-term rental board meetings to talk about what to do with the problem of short-term rentals and that is also another concern that we have to address right near the beginning before even making offers or making calls to the agent to walk through the property um, to even call your lender really those are initial things that you want to consider and i think that a lot of people um, they feel like they can analyze short-term rentals but uh, in reality, they're only looking at one out of maybe 12 to 15 different factors that they should be looking at. And so they feel like short-term rentals is very easy. But I, I think that short-term rentals are easy to acquire, but uh, it, especially when it's in a booming market. But I think when the market trends downwards, it's you, you'll see the folks that uh, didn't do their due diligence properly. And they are usually the folks who are now complaining that short-term rentals is not making as much money and, uh, short -term, and there's an Airbnb bust and et cetera. So uh, I do want to caution folks from not doing the proper due diligence when um, analyzing short-term rental deals. Yeah, that makes total sense. And so you've called out some of the, the factors like regulation, amenities, um, you know, looking at pro forma, et cetera. Uh, what, what are some of the other like kind of main factors that, um, you know, that are on your checklist? Market saturation, uh, how sophisticated the market is, how easy it is for someone to 
quickly upset the market and basically become one of the top listings. Um, there's a lot more factors. I think it's really dependent on the situation too. Uh, flooding or risk or hurricane risk or insurance risk. Like, you know, um, Florida as a, as a market, there's a lot more um, possibility that insurers are actually exiting out of the Florida market right now. So for me personally, even though I love Florida, I love visiting Florida, I wanted to buy in Florida. For me right now, I'm sitting out on the sidelines with regards to Florida um, because of the whole insurance related issue. So it's it, it just really state dependent, uh, local dependent in terms of which kind of factors kind of kind of pop up. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, like all a lot of the um, homeowners insurance companies are pulling out. They're just not going to insure in Florida anymore. It's just like one hurricane too many, right? It's not just hurricanes, but it's also the um, the roof, uh, the insurance claim fraud is a um, very big problem. I don't want to misquote um, mm. statistics on the podcast, but basically I think it was like, what, 70% of insurance uh, fraud claims were brought in Florida. And so because of all these claims, um, it's just cost prohibitive for insurance companies to stay in Florida. Yeah, totally. Um, how do you, how do you judge saturation? Like, cause when I look at popular places, there tend to be a lot of listings, right? How do you judge saturation? Well, there's a, if you are really nerdy about it, you can really just see how many listings there are per how many visitors a year. And that's a good judgment of saturation. And you can also see how many people are talking about it on the press. So there's, top 10 places to invest in short-term rentals a list out there for this property, uh, for this location, then it's probably oversaturated or it will be in the next year or so. Um, so I, I either have to get a killer deal on that to where if it's heavily advertised, I can probably resell it for a lot higher if the number's no longer cash flow for me, uh, or, or I just uh, completely avoid that market. Yeah. Makes sense. All right. So shifting gears a little bit toward the hotel side, where does the, your analysis process for, you know, underwriting a hotel deal differ from like an STR analysis? Like, could you walk through some of the factors that you, uh, that are on your checklist when analyzing a, you know, a new potential hotel deal? Um, yeah, I also, so we do have a mastermind for both STRs and for hotels, but I'm going to go through some of the things that I teach a lot of my mastermind in detail for. Um, so basically hotels, when I started hotel investing, I really thought that it was basically the same thing as short-term rental investing, just larger. Um, I couldn't be uh, more wrong um, because uh hotels are commercial assets and they really have a lot more in common with other commercial assets really than with short-term rentals. Um, so the first thing is data sources are different. So you have to analyze um, data from CoStar reports, which is a paid subscription. Um, and basically it provides you how much hotels are selling for in the area. It provides you how much the average nightly rate for different classes of hotels are. Um, it also shows you what the average cap rate or capitalization rate is in that area for hotels um, and what whether that's trending upwards or downwards or any of those numbers are trending upwards or downwards. So those are some of the things that you should be looking at. Hey, is the average daily rate going up or down? Is the occupancy going up or down? Is the rep par or revenue per available room going up and down uh, or down? Uh, and uh, is the cap rate going up or down? So those are some numerical things that you should be tracking in any given market that you're entering. And um, how much is this hotel um, in performing in terms of its competitors? Is it underperforming? Is it already uh, above average? We normally like hotels that are underperforming relative to their co competition or at least to the market average. So even if it's an economy brand hotel, but um, we are able to upgrade it to a, a much better boutique ex hotel experience, then we're okay with the fact that they're trending with their fellow economy branded hotels. Um, but normally we're looking at hotels that are underperforming and therefore based on uh, income based valuation, they're undervalued relative to the market. 
And it's not because they're undervalued because the seller can't, uh, the seller should have charged more for the sale. It's because they really can't charge anymore because they, their, their tax returns just don't support a higher valuation. And so those are usually the hotels that are interesting to us. But um, the, the parallel with short-term rentals is that location is everything. And so we do look at location and amenities in the same way that we um, look at in short-term rentals. And so figuring out what kind of amenities make the most sense for this area, figuring out what the trendier areas are and whether this can support a luxury brand hotel or is this more of extended stay hotel for corporate travelers, et cetera. Um, so those are all the data we clicked uh, up front before we even walk the hotel. And when we walk the hotel, we have to have a punch list of all, of course, of all the different things that we need to renovate in this hotel to bring it up to modern day standards. And, uh, and so those are some of the big things that we look for in our initial due diligence. And of course, the financials, the franchise agreements, if there are any hotel permits, um, zoning, talking to the city, there's a lot of additional steps basically in commercial acquisitions. Hmm, gotcha. Um, so it sounds like anyway, the um, at least as a first analysis, the financials, are. it sounds like they're, they're even maybe even more important uh, for hotels because um, you know, there's probably a lot more data available, the assets bigger, et cetera, but you're still doing some of the amenities and, and regulatory analysis as well, but it, it, it would, they would be different, right? Because hotels, as you said, are not subject to short-term rental regulations. So I had a couple of quick follow-ups. Like one is like, when you do an amenity analysis, are you comparing against other hotels or other STRs or, or both? I think we're looking at both. So for example, right now, whether we're keeping a pool for this hotel we're under contract for, I, my argument for keeping the pool is because some of the best short-term rentals and highest performing short-term rentals in the area have pools and hot tubs. So because of that, I think that we should keep this pool for this hotel. Um, we don't have the really the same level of transparency to figure out, hey, these hotels are performing that much better because they have pools um, with hotel data. You really just see, hey, uh, these are the luxury branded hotels and this is their market average average daily rate. So um, because of that, when it comes to amenities, sometimes I will refer back to short term rentals and figure out what kind of amenities really sell and what kind of copywriting when it comes to listings on Airbnb, what what are guests really saying about this listing and what which listings are ranked first on Airbnb? Yep, makes sense. Uh, and then because hotels are not subject to short-term rental regulations, you know, what type of regulatory diligence are you doing? Is it just to verify that their zoning in fact is hotel zoning and they have proper licenses and all that sort of thing? Or, or are there is there more than that? I've had instances where brokers are selling what they think is a hotel, but because it was um, special, it was actually zoned residential and it did have a grandfather use as a hotel, for example, but it no longer has that grandfather use because they've been using it as more of a multifamily use. And so they have lost that special use permit. Um, and for that reason, it's just not as valuable to us. And so we have to move on. So um, understanding how to draft your contract so that you can do that due diligence and not lose your earnest money and et cetera, that's something that is very, very complicated. So I don't recommend this for people to just try because um, on their own, really, for their first time, because it can get really messy really fast with all these different considerations. Makes sense. All right. Shifting gears a little bit. Um, I wanted to deep dive maybe a little bit more on regulation. So sort of back to STR land. How do you personally analyze a local city or county's STR regulations? Like specifically, what are the main red flags or green flags um, that you look for when researching STR regulations in a new market? You know, what are deal breakers, for example? What are things that are positive? Well, so I like it if it's a market that's traditionally very friendly to vacation rentals, even before Airbnb was ever a thing. So if they had tons of vacation rentals um, before Airbnb was a household name, then it's likely that they will not have very strict short-term rental re regulations. Um, and if 
at this point in 2023, I think that if the town doesn't have short-term rental regulations, there's no there's nothing out there. There's no literature out there about the negative effects of short-term rentals in this market. I think knock on wood, it's probably relatively safe from um, short-term rental regulations. If there are literature out there, you probably will find like, hey, we're considering the the, the negative effects. We're going to have town meetings about it. Uh, we are going to have multiple committees formed on researching the effects of short-term rentals. If you see those things, there are probably going to be short-term rental regulations coming down online. And the other positive thing is that if they already have short-term rental regulations, um, but they're pretty favorable. So you already know what the landscape is going to be. It's very unlikely that once the city has decided to tax short-term rentals and this is how much they're going to tax them, and this is a permitting process that they're going to completely scrap that system and start with a totally brand new framework. And so those are relatively safe towns to invest in um, as long as you follow the short-term rental regulations. We also like areas that it looks like from the outset that it's pretty illegal to run short-term rentals, but in reality, there are special zones in the city or pockets or zoning or you know just different areas that may actually allow for short term rentals and so there's a little loopholes that are present and um right under your nose really and so those are also some of the the strategies that we sometimes will use are there any deal breakers that you know from a regulation point of view where you know if you see it you're like nope move on there's really absolutes. I hate speaking in absolutes as a former attorney. Um, I will say that from my past experience, if the HOA is relatively anti short term rental, even if they don't have outright short term rental regulation in that town, even if their HOA rules don't have anything with regards to short term rentals, I'm just going to move on. Um, because having neighbors and HOA that does not like short term rentals in their backyard is just going to make a, a horrible guest experience anyway. Yeah, I do want to get to HOAs here in a minute. Um, uh, but I guess just to close out on like city and county regulations. Uh, so I hear you that, you know, you, um, you, you tend not to view, you know, particular items as deal breakers. Are there things that you, when you regu from a regulatory perspective, when you look at them, you're like, you know, well, I don't like it, but you know, maybe I can work around it and it basically won't be a deal breaker. And you'll, you know, you can still find a way to make it work. Are there things that basically you don't like, but you'll still do it, you know, given the right conditions? I don't know if I would have anything at this point where I'm like, you know, <laughs> lukewarm about something and I would still do it just because there's so many deals out there that I'm brought uh, daily, whether it's off market or on the MLS because of um, rel being um, on social media and publishing a lot of short-term rental and hotel content and also only a 47,000 member Facebook group that's um, short-term rental specific, I get brought a lot of deals that most people don't get access to. And so um, if a deal is not super ideal and there are certain things that I'm uncertain about, I just move on to the next deal. I tr don't try to make it work by tweaking this, tweaking that. I just think that there's plenty of efficiency and I don't really want to try to make a mediocre deal a good deal and i just only take the most outstanding deals we actually have too many deals to where um and not enough operators really to where sometimes we have to walk away with deals where the numbers make sense everything makes sense we're just not passionate about the project and so we walk away got it do you invest in condo uh, strs or, or have you in the past I have some condo short-term rentals and I only will buy them in condo complexes that are pretty much at least 50% short-term rentals already. So those are the only instances well, where I might buy condos. Um, and then also in markets where it's pretty much impossible to buy a short-term rental that is not a condo. Mm -hmm. And because of regulations and stuff like that, we will look at condos, but um, so I don't rule them out, but they're not my favorite. Hmm. Can you say more about why they're not their, your favorite? Is it just because the presence of an HOA? The presence of an 
HON and just having people above and below you just adds additional variables. Like your guests won't just complain about your property. They might complain about your neighbor and about someone out upstairs that left their toilet running and now there's water running down their walls. Like there's so many different variables that you can't really control, but it will still reflect negatively on your Airbnb listing. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, interesting. You know, if a condo complex is majority, um, STR, like, can you still get a normal loan on it? Um, so that's a question probably for your lender, but long story short, I think you can still get a loan and I've run into this issue before you can still get a 25% down loan. It's Makes just sense. not Fann Fannie Mae or Freddie, uh, Freddie Mac backed loan. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So shifting gears a little bit, I'd love to talk a little bit about, you know, sort of design and marketing. I know this is like one area that you're, you know, um, you, you know, you have like particular expertise in what are some of the most important interior and exterior design principles that you strive to implement in each new STR that you acquire both to, you know, a cold start your first initial bookings and B to make them, you know, stand out to potential guests in the future. It's really hard to nail down one or two things. I just really want people to feel like they're on vacation when they walk into the door. So for my beach rentals, it's going to be a totally different vibe and theme than for my mountain cabins and et cetera, because I really try to bring in the local atmosphere into my rentals. So in the mountains, it might feel a little more like a log cabin or feel a little bit more like rustic, but contemporary at the same time. Um, and um, and so I might have more wood wood or live edge accents. Um, and I might have more fire uh, features like a uh, fire pit or fireplace, electric fire panels, etc. cetera. Um, for beach rentals, it might be really cool wallpaper, funky wallpaper. It might be Art Deco influence. It might be uh, having wicker and a lot of plants and a lot of palm trees. Uh, so you feel like you're at the beach without going the whole kishy vibe. So I really, um, it really depends. But long story short, you don't want to decorate this vacation rental like you're decorating your house you also don't want to decorate it like um, a flip and so flips try to be not as non-offensive as possible to the larger no, not largest number of people so it's usually not really loud colors it's not really it doesn't really have a lot of personality in their style uh and it's probably mid-century modern or something like shabby chic or something like that is just like really boring stuff um for short term rentals wallpaper is great accent walls are great wall murals are great anything really go goes um having a whole arcade room is great so just having really crazy themes uh really flies with short term rentals and you know there's one of the most popular short term rentals is a giant potato in the middle of nowhere and it's just, it's, you got to stay in the potato for a couple hundred dollars a night. And so really just to draw the strangest things book really well, because people are looking for experience and they're not looking for staying in another house away from their home. Yeah, that's a good tip. Do you look to other um, sort of, you know, comparable short-term rentals for any like inspiration or ideas, or do you tend to just go with already with your own vision, you know, when you go in? I actually try to deviate from what other whatever is already popular out there because um, if the number one listing already looks a mountain bike theme, maybe I don't want to do a mountain bike theme just because uh, why am I just catering trying to beat the number one? Maybe I want to cater to the artsy folks who want something that's more modern art inspired. So. I try my best to definitely take uh, notes on uh, amenities of what are selling in that market, but um, I really try not to copy other people's style because those are, you want to stand out. You don't want to blend in. Yeah, makes sense. All right. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what are the most important marketing principles that you follow to help your listing 
like get ranked highly on Airbnb and Verbo. And, you know, here I'm not necessarily talking about some of the obvious things like, hey, use professional photography or, you know, get five-star reviews or write a compelling headline or property description. Those seem like common sense, but like more tactical, like assuming you will invest in professional photography, you know, how should the photos be shot or sequenced or for best visual impact? You know, are there any tips around staging or wide angles or lighting, things like that? And similarly, when it comes to like your headline and property description, what are some tactical best practices for writing those for like kind of evoking the feelings or emotions you want to elicit to persuade the guest to book? Well, I, I hesitate to say too much detail because Airbnb and VRBO are list like are living search engines. So their algorithms change all the time. So what's relevant uh, right now, it's not going to be relevant five, six months from now, because there's a lot of large Airbnb rollouts have changed how things are ranked in the last, even last year. So uh, for example, tree houses and et cetera, and unique listings are now featured a lot more prominently um, uh, on the Airbnb homepage. So um, it's really constantly changing. So you just have to be really good about either being a part of mastermind, being part of Facebook groups, being part of communities and staying up to date on these um, changes on a daily basis, a weekly basis. Um, so hopefully that wasn't too vague, but it honestly, what I, the advice, I'm gonna wait until that car. Um, so hopefully that wasn't really vague advice uh, because it really does change from month to month what is the best practices for airbnb um i will say that uh in 2023 the largest trend is to get away from just using these listing platforms and using your own direct booking site or doing direct marketing a lot more to bring guests and back to your unit and having a little more control over your listing in terms of uh, photography it's no longer just hey, use your iPhone and take some pictures and um, just do DIYs, uh, you know, aesthetics everywhere. It's no longer, you really have to be sophisticated. So hiring an interior designer or hiring a professional to do a mural or hiring a professional photographer and paying a couple hundred dollars more to do drone photography or paying a couple hundred dollars to have twilight photos on top of just having daylight photos, all those things are gonna have a bigger ROI in 2023. Uh, you might've been able to get away with a cohesive, um, just uh, things are, you know, like um, mediocre design or mediocre photography and stuff like that um, a year ago, two years ago, but nowadays you really have to set it up. Okay, so I, I also wanted to kind of get your thoughts on, like when it comes to customer service, um, whether you have any sort of guest experience tips for creating like little unique moments of delight for guests to you know maximize the chance that you can get that five-star review. So here I'm thinking like from the moment of first interaction in terms of messaging to the check-in experience, to the stay itself, and finally check out, are there any tactics that you have found that help you know guests leave your stay with that kind of warm and fuzzy feeling that makes them feel delighted and makes it a no-brainer to leave a five-star review i would say the simple things just not well, first of all even before the guest ever arrives just don't skimp on um in your initial setup so the bed the linens etc those are things that are very very important so don't skimp on them and don't skimp on the renovations um leave no detail untouched uh, those are really, really important, um, but also leaving a personal touch, maybe a welcome. I've seen people for luxury vacation rentals have custom welcome mats, like it will say welcome the the Bob, Bob family or whatever, you know, um, when they arrive. That's a huge wow factor, which I think that that will leave a memorable impression. You can play their favorite song on the TV when they arrive. You can have, hey, even if you don't have a welcome doormat, you can put that on the TV. If you have a hospitality TV, uh, you can have a little sign that's a chalkboard that's a little more low budget, low tech version. And you can have a little gift, gift, gift basket that's for local goods, like local cheeses, local bakery, et cetera, local snacks, local coffee, roasters, um, local snack bars, uh, local soaps, whatever, you know, in that maybe like $30 worth of stuff 
uh, for a $300 a night stay um, kind of thing. So normally 10% of the one night stay kind of pricing for your gift basket. Um, you can have um, diffusers uh, diffusing um, essential oils since you don't probably want artificial scents. A lot of you are allergic to that. So you want to use all natural, maybe cinnamon sticks. Just having um, all five senses being touched as soon as you walk into the door. Uh, you might have uh, the fireplace, you know, on if it's electric fireplace. Um, so when people walk in, it feels really warm and welcoming. You want to make sure that your friends and family have stayed at the place to troubleshoot anything. So, hey, this plug's a little bit too far or, hey, this lamp, it's a little bit weird in where it's placed. Um, hey, I keep tripping over this cord, all those little things that maybe you, because you set it up, it doesn't seem apparent to you because you just know to step over that cord or you know to reach a little bit more to the right to find that light switch, but uh, your guest is going to be brand new and your fr friends and family who don't know your house, uh, they are probably going to be confused. So just getting all those little details right and getting other people to review your listing, um, brutally honest and being br brutally honest near the beginning is crucial. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, you know, if you're not living in the city where your str property is located um how do you implement these things do you do you have your property manager do it assuming you use one do you hire a task rabbit like how do you get the gift basket or the you know the essential oils or whatever the case may be actually like set up and like reset with each turn it's going to be really hard if you're remote i'm not going to lie um i think that the best way is probably to get partner with a local operator who can help you with that initial setup whether it's just a one-time thing where they help consult on these tasks and you know figure out hey this is your sourcing for all these things or partnering with a local management company um i in the past have advertised you know uh, advocated for self-management but i think with the new shifts and how airbnb uh, guest expectations have risen i think it's actually more beneficial for brand new house to now come in immediately from day one analyze the deals assuming that you're going to have to hire uh, a management company and pay them 20 25 percent um and then just partner with them and let the pros do it uh, they know the area they probably already have access to all the snacks and gift basket ideas they have seen what things normally guests hate they have seen what things guests love and they can be invaluable to you in your journey as an investor yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, I know they they generally the the take rate for um STR property management is like it could be 25%, could be more. Um you you generally it's probably not going to be that much less. Um but is it fair to say that, you know, you can look to your property manager for these kinds of expectations for these kind of like little, you know, bells and whistles and little delight things that, that like that is that that's is that fair game is that kind of in their expectation that they will do these things or is that um sometimes like extra stuff that you would have to negotiate in uh it depends on the company so if they don't do it for their other clients they're probably not going to do it for you but if they already have an add-on uh they already do it for some of their clients they probably have it as part of their contract and i've seen mm -hmm. it to where they have a little check box like hey i want to get back to it it's going to be 30 dollars extra every single turn or hey i want um your linens instead of my linens it's going to be this much additional per month. So it just really depends on the local short term rental management company. And yeah, you can try to do this by yourself. But a lot of folks that I have as my mentees and my short term rental mastermind, they're normally busy W2 professionals, and they're trying to uh, create financial freedom for them in the near future. But the, right now, they can't take any additional days off. And so um, for those people, for my for my mastermind folks, I'm able to help in the design and setup of some of these properties. But after that, I really do at this point recommend folks to find a local management company. In the past, my my advice was like, hey, if you want to self-manage, you can. 
Um, and uh, these are the things that, uh, that are best practices, but I've just seen more and more issues uh, with Airbnb and guests that can be easily resolved and a lot less painful if you had a local management team to begin with. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Um, I wanted to shift a little bit to automation. Um, you know, you, you got a dozen of these things now. So I imagine you have some automation processes and that seems to be like, a that is a really important thing to scaling. What are automation strategies and tools that, you know, you use to help you automate your STR operations? I mean, through the whole booking life cycle, starting from, you know, dynamic pricing for lead generation to messaging guests before they book to the booking experience itself, the check-in experience, the actual stay, responding to questions during the stay, check out, et cetera. What are the main tasks or workflows you automate? And, um, you know, what are some of the software and hardware tools you use to do it? Um, honestly, the, the tools are changing all the time. So what we use the most is really uh, turnover BNB for cleaning. And we use, there's a couple big players in the space of uh, pricing automation, but we use price labs for now. Um, so those are usually the two that I am able to recommend. Um, in terms of booking back end and stuff like that, we, we have Guesty, we have Hostfully, we have Owner Res. There's a lot of different software out there. Currently, I don't have a recommendation for those. I talk about all of those when we, uh, and the pros and cons, honestly, in our short term window mastermind, um, and basically compare all the different technology. But uh, it, it really depends on your level of understanding uh, how, how technical you are, for example, what is used, maybe one person that's really highly technical might do better with one um, set of tech stack versus another person who's a lot less technical and has to keep it really simple. And so they have to deal do better with another different tech stack. So, uh, so right now, um, so using price labs for pricing automation and using turnover BNB uh, as one of the more popular cleaner turnover solutions. Um, those are probably the big things that we are using uh, and recommending to our students across the board. But, you know, depending on the students needs, it might be different recommendations as well. Do you do self check in or do you do like in person check in with somebody on the ground? We, I, I don't, I, I think in most cases, I don't think it's industry standard at all to do in-person check-in just because some guests are going to be checking in at midnight and some guests are going to be checking in at 4 p.m. Yeah, it makes sense. And so do you have like, you know, like smart lock that synchronizes and, and understands like when the guest is coming, et cetera, and knows how to. Uh, yeah. Sort of, so. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a, a whole basically in our curriculum we have a whole module on technology and how to sync everything to each other so that you have a seamless tech integration into airbnb and vrbo but yes we do use smart locks for self check-in okay um do, to what extent do you personally are you personally you know involved in messaging guests at this point uh versus you know having like automated responses I don't, I don't, I don't message any of the guests at this point. I mean, I'll, I'll answer questions that only I can answer, but I have VAs, I have teams that do guest comms for me. Hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Um, uh, so I, I was curious, you know, you're, you're now you're messing with partners, um, particularly in some of the larger deals now, um, and on, you know, maybe other deals that in you know residential str you've invested solo um how did you how did you meet your investment partners um i run a very large airbnb investors group on facebook and that's a large source but just posting about what i do and the returns that i get is one of our largest sources for investors and honestly people come to me to learn uh first and they uh and they might have followed my content for quite a while online before they have ever reached out to me to invest with me. So a lot of times my investors, they say that they have known me for a while now uh, before, but I, you know, even though it's a first initial contact or whatever, they, they basically say that. Mm. I see. I, oh, my, my computer might die. So, oh, I don't know. I don't know where my cord is. Um, 
What, what, what percent are you at? 11. Uh, might be okay. Might be okay. Um, you want to keep rolling? Uh, how, many, how many more questions do you have? Uh, we're, we're close to the end, I think. Okay, um, let's just, uh, let's just, uh, if it might die, so just, okay. um, but yeah. Um, are, are there any, you know, um, main tips that you have in terms of like when you structure partnerships, you know, key principles that you kind of make sure that are captured in your partnership agreements to ensure that incentives stay tightly aligned? I'm not talking about like all the details of the partnership agreement, but like some of the key principles that you try to incorporate. I don't really want to talk about legal stuff on the the podcast per se because it's hard to say what the legal structure is. It really depends on the deal. But I will say generally, um, if it's a smaller deal, we'll do a joint venture where uh, they are equity partners. Um, and then for larger deals, we'll do um, the standard syndication or we'll do a fund. And we are raising ten million dollars as part of our five hundred six C fund. Um, for investors and um, it's hard, hard to really go into the waterfall structure and the stuff like that to make sure that uh, everyone's interests are aligned. But uh, long story short, um, our, our rates are usually and our returns are very comparable or better compared to a lot of the larger syndications and funds. Okay. Um, what, what do you think most STR and hotel investors, you know, give up or fail? that, you know, you've been able to over overcome to, you know, find uh, the success, success that you have? Um, I think that most investors don't underwrite their deals carefully enough. And I've seen many cases where people analyze deals that, for example, at a much lower interest rates than what they were actually given um, for, because they let, maybe the rates were going up throughout the whole closing process. It was no, not locked for whatever reason, or it became uh, the lock uh, rate expired or whatever, and they just continued to close on the deal. Um, so they just pay too much for their deal and they didn't really analyze the deal properly. Another thing is that I've seen people just refuse to spend money on renovating or decorating their property. I've had many folks try to reach out to me um, to set up their property and their budget was $5,000 or $10,000 all in. I'm like, you might as well not do short term rentals at that point for a three bedroom, two bath house. It's just, it's too little. And I would recommend you not doing short term rentals if that's your budget, because in 2023, you really just can't do a good job if you're not going to spend what it takes to build out a very memorable experience for your guests. Um, so I think people have unrealistic expectations that they can spend very little and get uh, C suite executives to stay at their home because because of they have really good location or something I'm like c-suite executives are probably going to require a larger amount of amenities and what you're willing to budget for and so i think those are the main reasons why people fail um another reason is just uh not um being a people person and not recognizing that early in the process so um i recognize that uh you know it's not the highest and best use of my personality and time and uh, talents to be the guest communications person. So um, even on a hotel scale, I have uh, my business partner who is uh, an amazing people manager and relationship manager, and he's able to do a much better job um, training our staff to communicate with guests and et cetera uh, than I am. And I stick to my lane. And so understanding your talents and where your shortcomings are. Um, so for a lot of folks, they don't have the patience or personality to be really good short-term mental operators. And if that's the case with them, they need to hire someone to do that role. All right. Thanks so much for taking the time to chat with me. Um, how can listeners uh, get in touch with you, find out more about what you're up to? So the best way to find out and keep up with me is through social media. So I'm pretty active on both Facebook at Airbnb Professional Host, uh, which hopefully will be in the show, show notes, right? Um, yep. And then also um, on Instagram at Dia ESQ, which is spelled D-I-Y-A ESQ. All right. Uh, we'll link to those in the show notes. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me and uh, you know look forward to sharing this with uh, our listeners. Thank you so much for having me.
All right, take care.